I was once at a church service where a guest pastor was exhorting the congregation to get out of their Christian ghetto and go do some good for the world. He said we are too comfortable staying within church circles and surrounding ourselves with the people who are just like us. He said we should get out of the salt shaker and get out from under the bushel. I agreed with the guest pastor until he said that we should take our kids out of Christian schools. And then I was completely taken aback when a significant portion of the audience responded with enthusiastic applause and I think even a little cheering. I think I heard more than a little vindication in their applause. I suspect they might have experienced some pressure over the years from these zealous Christian school supporters, possibly a little judgment. As someone who has dedicated over 35 years to the furthering of Christian education, I was saddened as I drove home because there seemed to be a passionate opposition to Christian education in at least part of the congregation. But I was also frustrated because the minister's comments were based on a complete misunderstanding of Christian education as I experience it every day. Many sincere Christian parents send their children to the local public school for all kinds of reasons. One that I often hear expressed is that they believe, like the guest pastor, that the children of Christians need to be salt and light in the world. I'd like to push back a little on this and argue that the best way to be salt and light in the world is to send your kids to the Christian school. But we need to first understand what we mean by Christian education, because not all Christian schools are alike, and I'm not ready to defend all of them with equal fervor. There are three basic kinds of Christian schools, and their differences lie in how they understand Christ's relationship to culture. H. Richard Niebuhr wrote a book called Christ and Culture, and in it he describes different Christian stances toward culture. The first stance Niebuhr calls Christ against culture. By this way of thinking, everything is divided up between the good things of God and the evil things of the world. Jesus doesn't like culture, and neither should we. Christians need to turn from culture because it is irredeemably tainted by sin. We need to keep our eyes on the good things of God. The school arising from this view is to protect and isolate children from the world. Many of the classroom resources would likely be published by Christian publishing companies. The library would have books that you'd find in Christian bookstores and not a lot that you wouldn't. Certainly not Harry Potter and probably not George Orwell or Mark Twain. I've talked about the limitations of this stance in my video called The Sacred Secular Divide. Here's the link. This is the sort of school the guest pastor was critiquing. I agree there's not much salt or light happening here, but this is not the only kind of Christian school that there is. Niebuhr then explains several more stances. These positions do not frame the relationship between Christ and culture as an either-or proposition. They see the good in culture, and anything that's good is of Christ, or they see Christ as neutral to good, and that it can be perfected by Christ. The Christ of, or the Christ above culture model. These views can give rise to a second type of Christian school. In these schools, there is little reason for the curriculum to be much different than that of the local public school. The things that we learn in math or history or PE are good, or at worst, neutral, and can be presented as is. What makes these schools distinctly Christian are the various devotional practices that have been added to the schedule, devotions at the beginning of each day, weekly chapels, and religious education classes. We might think of the Christian aspects of this sort of school as the creamy icing spread over the already pretty decent cake that is the standard curriculum. This view of the relationship between Christ and culture is perhaps at the root of many sincere Christian parents sending their children to the public school. What the child learns at school may be considered as, at worst, philosophically neutral, and one can rely on the healthy devotional life within the family and the church for the spiritual nurturing of the child. This, I think, is the position that the guest pastor has when he encourages people to leave the Christian school. Where the first anti-culture view underemphasizes the good in creation, this more pro-culture view underemphasizes the extent to which sin has distorted God's good creation, including culture. The failure to appreciate the extent of sin often results in a failure to appreciate the scope of Christ's redemption. That is not good. There is a third type of Christian school. 
This is the sort of school I strongly support. It is unlike the Christ against culture model in that it has a far more hopeful view of culture. It is unlike the Christ of or above culture model in that it places a greater emphasis on the depth and breadth of the effects of sin. The view of culture from which this school arises is what we might call the Christ redeeming culture model. Adherents of this type of Christian school recognize three fundamental truths. First, that culture is a manifestation of God's good creation and a product of human creativity and community. Second, that sin distorts every part of this good creation. Thus, there is nothing created that was not created good, but there is nothing that has not been distorted by the fall. A third truth is that Christ is the redeemer of all the things that God created. This process began with his death and resurrection, and continues even now by the work of his spirit through his people. This school's task then is to discover, develop, and celebrate the gifts with which God has equipped each student and begin to use these gifts for the flourishing of the body of Christ, our neighbor, our culture, and the world. This Christian school would explore all aspects of creation, including culture, and celebrate the creational goodness that we find there. But it would also train students to discern evil not just out there, where it certainly is, but also inside our most intimate circles and within ourselves. This results in humility and a deep understanding of our need for grace. In this school, we also seek to bless our neighbors and to seek justice and to take care of creation. And we are not preparing children to do this when they grow up. We are doing it right now. We recycle and compost and help with a local park dealing with invasive species. We work with our literal neighbors to beautify their strata's dumpsters. We collect hundreds of pounds of rice to be shipped to those who are hungry, and we make to-go meals for busy single parents in our community, and we fix their cars. It also means we are involved in culture as we develop the skills to be movie makers, lawyers, florists, plumbers, medical practitioners, and citizens, possibly parents, and always good neighbors. The work of redemption is Christ's but we are invited to participate in it. We are called to imitate Jesus, like a child who enthusiastically pushes his plastic lawn mower behind his dad when he's mowing the lawn. We say, look mom, we're mowing the lawn. I contend that all things being equal, a child educated in this kind of Christian school is best equipped to be salt and light in the world over an entire lifetime. There's another pastor I want to tell you about. He was a good friend of mine and he didn't support the Christian school either. He sent his girls to the local public school. His reasons were a little different than the guest pastor. He believed that Christian schools were dualistic. You may have watched my video about Christian dualism that I referred to earlier. Quite correctly, my friend wanted to avoid the tendency for Christians to divide life into God stuff and other stuff. So aren't Christian schools dualistic? His answer was yes. On his deck one evening, I explained that some Christian schools were not dualistic. In fact, that they were the most holistic of a type of education you can get. Well, the Christ against culture Christian schools are clearly dualistic. They separate God stuff from the secular stuff and then they trash the secular stuff as much as is possible. The second type of icing on the cake Christian school is also dualistic. It's dualistic in the same way that so many evangelical Christians are dualistic. There is a distinct line between the God stuff in their life and the secular stuff. It's just that the line runs within the school rather than between the school and the rest of culture. Daily devotions, weekly chapels, and the Bible classes are the God things. The other classes and sports teams and the school play are the ordinary things. My school and others like it reject the sacred secular dualism within its walls and between itself and culture. It's not just the daily devotions, weekly chapels, and Bible classes that put the Christian into Christian school. It's also what we teach and how we teach it. We will usually use secular textbooks, but we don't just use them. We discern the worldviews from which they are written. We don't easily accept what we find in culture or what we find on the first page of a Google search, but we don't easily reject it either. We hold tightly to biblical truths, but we know the difference between central Christian beliefs and those that we hold with an open hand. Because our classmates hold views a little different than ours. We don't avoid the hard questions, and we learn how to listen, even when we don't agree. The books in the library are not simply Christian or safe books, but they are good books and they are true books. 
And they're beautiful books. And sometimes they're not so beautiful, but they tell us things we need to remember. We want our students' natural response to others in need to be empathy and action. We learn that when we have wronged someone, it's not always enough to grudgingly say, I'm sorry. Something deeper needs to be restored. We learn about rights, but we also learn about responsibilities. When we read literature, we understand it to be a conversation about what it means to be human that has been going on for thousands of years, and that the biblical contributions to this conversation are to be understood as divinely inspired. Science is the study of God's other book, Creation. So creation can't be in conflict with scripture because he is the author of both. History is digging into human faithfulness and unfaithfulness to the purposes for which God made us. PE is about the temple of the Holy Spirit. Home ec is about serving our neighbor. The arts are about creating responses to all of the above. Christ isn't the icing. He's more like the baking powder that leavens the whole cake. Or maybe he's the sugar. He's in the whole cake and really concentrated in the icing. This, by the way, is called a labored metaphor, but you get the idea. But it's not just the Christian content of the classes or those devotional practices that makes our school decidedly Christian. All aspects of the school fall under the Lordship of Christ. The way we take attendance, maybe responding to your name called off an alphabetical list of names with here is efficient, but it might not communicate that each student is beloved and that our identity is rooted in being created in the image of God. Maybe filling in bubbles with a number two pencil is not the most accurate measurement of the things that we actually want students to be able to do when they graduate. Sure, we use technology because it's a powerful tool, but its power can easily be bent and twisted along with everything that's good. So we need to learn how to use it and how not to use it. How do we respond to students who excel and how about those who struggle? What does discipline look like from a biblical perspective? How do we finalize the budget? And what is the criterion by which we decide what programs we offer? At the foundation of all these and all other conversations is the will of Jesus, our Lord and King. To my friend and pastor, I explained that if he wanted to avoid dualism, he ought not to send his kids to the local public school. They operate under the same dualistic philosophy as the Christ against culture model, just from the other side. There, all religious and spiritual stuff is banished from the public to the private sphere, leaving a supposedly neutral curriculum. There is no such thing as a religiously neutral education. Big questions, we have to live out of answers to those questions. So instead of looking to heaven for those answers in the public school, we tend to do what's pragmatic what makes the best business sense, what's in line with the current spirit of the age, which changes every 10 years or so. Individual autonomy is assumed. Classroom resources are not neutral. I've made a video in which I engage in a conversation with a public school textbook, one we use in our school. The link is here for that video. There is no such thing as religious neutrality. So the decision that parents are making when they choose a school is not between a dualistic Christian school and a neutral public school. It's between a dualist school and a non-dualist school. A non-dualist school is one that places Christ in his proper place, the place of king over creation and over everything else. So the guest pastor at my church, the one that wanted people to take their kids out of the Christian school and get out into the world, he wanted them to be salt and light in the world. I contend that the injunction that we find in scripture to be salt and light in the world is an argument for Christian education, not against it. Christians ought to let their light shine before men. But this is meant for Christians, not for the children of Christians. At what point would a child be able to be salt and light? Merely by being from a Christian home? Maybe after a conversion experience? It seems to me that for an individual to be salt and light, they need to be a Christian and not just from a Christian family, and that it requires some wisdom and spiritual maturity. How many people less than 17 have developed enough wisdom and spiritual maturity? Some of them for sure. All of them? But this is not my main point. This is. The command to be salt and light in the world is not an injunction just for the individual Christian. Look at the metaphors. Salt does not do what salt does as an individual crystal. And we are to be a light, like a city on a hill. 
A city is a community. We are to set up communities of faith. And as communities, we are called to be salt and light in the world. North Americans, including North American Christians, are tremendously individualistic. We interpret our world through an individualistic lens. We naturally read salt and light as an, as an instruction to individuals. This is one of the very idols that a good Christian education attempts to reveal and combat. Because our schools are redemption focused, we interact with our neighbors, other schools, and our cities. We have something to share because what we believe about Jesus Christ is true, not just for Christians, but for everyone and everything. So we collectively witness to all those involved in education, to all those in our immediate neighborhood, and to our cities and towns. Our school takes the shape of what every school should be like, and we shine like a city on a hill in every way we can. I'm not saying that Christian teachers ought to teach only in Christian schools. As a matter of fact, this is a vital place where the light of the gospel needs to be reflected. I also want to be clear that I am not saying that sending one's children to a public school is the wrong thing to do. I have heard many stories of Christian children being a blessing to their local schools. What I do want to claim is that the salt and light argument ought not to be understood as a biblical injunction against sending your children to Christian schools if it's the right kind of Christian school. Rather than isolating children, as the guest pastor supposed, a Christian education meaningfully engages the world with a full understanding of the gospel, collectively. And it is always my hope, our hope, that as students grow up, that they will do much to impact the world, both as individuals and as members of communities. And we believe that that best happens if they are working on that right now. Thank you for watching and God bless.